I spun out of my body into a dimension that had no time. The first thing I remember was my hearing went away. I couldn't see anything. It was just black. I had no body. I was just shooting up and out of my body into another place that I had never been and realized I didn't have a body, but I had 101% full awareness. I felt the presence of many, many beings around me. They were sending me so much love. All of my anxiety, busy mind from earth was completely gone. They all knew me and I knew them. I've never felt so at home anywhere on earth. I had been here before. In 2017, I was the passenger in a car. We were driving on a high mountain road and I was with my ex-partner. Our car lost control. We started spinning out of control because another car came in our lane and we had nowhere to go. And we spun on to the gravel shoulder and then spun back into the road and hit a completely different car <laughs> that was following the other car. And then we flipped upside down and landed with our wheels facing up, the roof crushed, and we were teeter-tottering on the edge of the mountain. So on the guardrail, half the car was hanging over the edge of the cliff and the other half was on the roadside. So what my experience was during this accident was as soon as the car lost control, just the split second I saw that we were going to be in a big accident, I closed my eyes just instinctively. I don't know why I did this, but I closed my eyes. I leaned back into my seat and I decided I would die peacefully. And the next thing I remember is losing my hearing. Now, this I just want to say the accident was probably, you know, two or three seconds of earth time, but I spun out of my body into a dimension that had no time. So the first thing I remember was my my hearing went away. I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't see anything. It was just black. And then I felt like I had no body. And it was just this super lightness, like I was just shooting up and out of my body into another place that I had never been. The next thing that I noticed was I had a sense of my surroundings, even though I couldn't see. And I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, but I could sense that I was kind of in a safe, um, dark, maybe pillowy, soft, feathery container that felt extremely secure. And what I kind of adjusted to being there and realized I didn't have a body, but I had 101% full awareness I felt the presence of many, many beings around me and like I couldn't exactly see and make them out at first, but they felt like they were sending me so much love. I felt like love and acceptance and familiarity was kind of beaming at me in all directions and I realized that I was mostly just awareness and knowing and all of my anxiety, all of my tension, all of my busy mind from earth was completely gone. It's hard to kind of compare it to anything, but if you've ever kind of like woken up in the morning in a nice warm bed, maybe you're on holiday, maybe you're, you know, sleeping in bed with someone you love. And it's that moment where you wake up and you're like, but it was like that times, times a thousand. And then I noticed that there was kind of like this familiarity of these beings and I couldn't exactly place it, but I realized I'd been here before. I passed through whatever place this was in the spirit world many times and these beings that could have been angels or ancestors, I'm not sure, they all knew me and I knew them. And now kind of after all this time reflecting, I consider that these were soul family of some sort in the spirit world who have known me in other lifetimes, who have known me in other dimensions besides earth, who have always supported me and I've supported them. And so all of this happiness and love and acceptance and kind of excitement at the reunion was coming at me and it was just taking up my whole awareness. 
And that's all that I was. There was no access, like I said, to my anxiety or my earthly hangups. I was just like them in that place. There is no way anything dark or difficult or sad could ever, ever enter that place. It just would have been impossible. And I don't know how long in spirit world time I was there, but it seemed like a very long time and there wasn't any words exchanged. It was kind of like this experience of remembering who I was, the real essence of the true self of me without all the human layers and knowing that I have a, a unique place in the universe. I belong to this soul family. I belong in this dimension. There's probably, you know, many dimensions beyond that in the spirit world, but that's where I got to be. And without any words exchanged or messages to bring back to humanity. So however long I was there in the spirit world time, I don't know. But at some point, I woke up in the car, hanging upside down over the cliff. And all I could see was upside down trees. And all I could hear was people yelling and then metal scraping, you know, what in a car accident. And I was completely filled with bliss. Um, even though we'd been in this accident and I'm hanging upside down over the edge of a cliff, I did not care because I had just gone to what felt like the most familiar home I could ever imagine. I've never felt so at home anywhere on earth ever. And I realized that everything was going to be okay, no matter if I'm dead or alive, if I'm in the human body or outside of the human body. I am totally fine. And if anything, I'm more fine when I'm outside of the body because I got to be with I got to be with all of these precious soul family members and feel their love. So that's what happened on the day of my car accident. Wow, such an impressive story. And also the way you describe it is this place of feeling at home and feeling joy and feeling peace. It must have been I'm thinking disappointing to come back to Earth, was it? Yeah, that's a really that's a really great way to put it. At first when I came back, I was literally just so full of happiness and joy and bliss that I didn't even care. Like I was hanging over the edge of the cliff and it totally didn't faze me because I was just so full of this. But as the months would pass on, and life would start again, then yes, the answer to that is absolutely a massive, massive contrast started to set in because at a certain point when kind of the bliss settled, I did enter a very dark night of the soul and realized even though there was this realm of reality that it was very more real than earth, it was so real. I had no idea when I was going to be able to get back there. Like, you know, we could live until we're, you know, 90 or 100 years old and earth is very hard. So absolutely the contrast set in, in an unbelievable way. I can imagine. And since that experience, have you had any other out of body experiences or was it easier for you to communicate back to those entities that you've met then? Yes. So again, this happened in 2017 and we're recording this 2024. So basically the first two years after the accident were, were pretty connected. I felt extremely connected. No problem kind of like getting myself. I mean, it was never as close as the actual near-death experience, but I could... I could really feel very connected to the spirit world. I had one visit from an angel, which had never happened or haven't or hasn't happened since. And even that, like that was in that two years. Then there was several years, maybe two and a half of a very dark night of the soul where there was zero connection. So it was like I had like so much and then the complete opposite. And in that time, I participated in some plant medicine ceremonies with ayahuasca and some other shamanic practices, which had a lot of out-of-body experiences. But I would say the main, most powerful out-of-body experience I've had since the car accident happened very recently. It was about six weeks ago, and I was, I was just waking up in the morning, and I was not fully back on earth. I could feel my bed. I could kind of sense the room. So I, I knew I was back on earth, but my 90% awareness 
was in another dimension that felt extremely similar in nature to the place I went in my near-death experience. But this time there was more of a visual that I, I was able to access. I could see kind of like in my mind's eye this it was again an enclosed container like a chamber and I remember there being reds and pinks on the wall and what looked like kind of like beautiful gold carvings around me it seemed like a very sacred place a special place coming from the walls I realize this sounds kind of crazy but kind of coming at me from every direction it was like the walls were alive with love and it wasn't just the feeling of love. It was as though everything around me was the presence of God or source. And I couldn't see any beings. I couldn't see divinity. But it was like everything was divinity. And that same love and that same kind of like pillowy, cushiony acceptance that was just coming at me to the point where it was almost too much to handle. And so I closed my eyes. Even though I could feel my bed, I thought, oh, I want to stay here for as long as I possibly can. And again, there was no words. There was no voice. There was just this knowing who I was, a child of the universe, a child of divinity, and a complete feeling of being really cherished, really like it was just me and divinity in this place. Nothing could ever hurt me here. And it had never gone anywhere, even though I'd had my accident, lived my life in between. It It is a place that is outside of space and time, and it never disappears. It's just us that kind of like goes into the human awareness. When I did kind of wake up and get out of bed, I'm not sure how long this lasted, like maybe five minutes. I just started crying. I just started weeping and weeping and weeping, like saying basically like, thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to come back here to remember again in like a very felt way of the truth of who I am, how much I'm loved as a child of God, how much I belong to, you know, to the creator. And yeah, I, I now I'm a little bit curious about people's near death experiences, out of body experiences when they're that filled with love and acceptance. I wonder sometimes, like, are we going to a dimension that is part of heaven or part of the great heart of the universe that is just very much connected to our heart inside? So we, we have this connection. It's just outside of the body. So I don't know if I slipped into my heart center. I don't know where I went, but all I can say is it, it was very real. How did this experience of the car accident and the experience that followed how did it change your life? After the accident, I started to feel really sensitive. I became what people would refer to as a highly sensitive person, like overnight. So I started becoming really sensitive to all the areas of my life. The first thing was my relationship with my long-term partner. We, we'd had problems, but now the problems seemed absolutely huge. And I realized that we weren't a fit for each other. So our relationship dissolved after 13 years. I realized my job as a paramedic was making me very sick. I had been in denial about that. And I quit my job of, yeah, about 13 years also as a paramedic. I started to notice my relationships. Most of my friendships, social circle was based on gossip, complaining, just like things that weren't life-giving that didn't bother me before. But it started to drain me. I realized that there's such thing as people pleasing and I was a classic people pleaser. I would not say no to heart to, to anything. You know, you invite me somewhere and I'm like almost, you know, so tired and sick and I would go anyway. I was afraid that if I didn't say yes and please my friends that they maybe would not want to be my friend. They maybe wouldn't like me. They maybe would think that I was snobby, like all these kind of things. So all of these friendships that I had had over the years started to feel very off to me because I had this real need to feel authentic and safe in all my interactions. And I realized no one was going to do that for me. I had to do that myself. As a result, most of my friendships started to slowly dissolve as well and fall apart. Some with like a big bang and some just kind of like fell, fell out of the 
wayside. I was now single and living in a three bedroom house full of stuff. And it felt like a lot of work to upkeep the old house. I started selling and giving away most of my belongings after I sold the house until I was down to about two suitcases. And that wasn't the plan. It just kind of was happening. I was just going with it because I, every time I would kind of like sell a large piece of furniture or give away a bunch of stuff in a box, I felt lighter and I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to keep on going. I took my two suitcases. I moved into a camper van. I lived in the camper van for about two years. For the first time, I really sunk into nature and started to meditate. And so I started to kind of like let go of the busy mind that I was only used to and spend my days. I I was, you know, I had some savings from my house. Let's just kind of spend my days by lakes in forests, visiting people I hadn't seen in a long time and slowing things down. I'd always been afraid of slowing down because, you know, who wants to sit with themselves? Who knows what kind of bad feelings might come up? But I was still kind of in the bliss of the car accident. So I had the support of that experience to make all these kind of changes. And then When the pandemic started, I sold my van and I went down to one suitcase and I moved out of Canada and I've been kind of slow traveling around the world, you know, six months here, six months there ever since the pandemic. But I would say that after the biggest changes came with having to really take a look at the life that I had created physically, but also the way that I was showing up in the world, everything started to come under reckoning because of the high sensitivity and realizing that I had been pushing myself and kind of contorting into a box that was created by, you know, society, my family, my own programming and expectations. And it was really too painful to stay in there. I love that. And I love that you were able to recognize that the things that Because, of course, your relationship, your house, your job were things that you were working for. So you did put effort into it. And I feel it's so difficult for us to take something that we've invested our time or money sometimes in and say, well, it's no longer serving me. It's so difficult to get to that reckoning because we tend to operate under the model that if I've always wanted a house... That's what I've always wanted and I will always want it. And I think with relationships, the same, you know, the person that you would have wanted probably when you were 16 or 17 is not the same person that you would want when you're 25 or in your 30s. So we need to give ourselves, I think, a lot of grace with navigating those changes and accepting it as normal because we're growing thus our desires our needs are also growing and evolving and also i think we need to constantly ask ourselves if the things that we're doing are fulfilling and it seems like you did the hard job i think of asking those questions and finding out that no those things that you had worked for and put a lot of effort in were no longer fulfilling you and i also want to know from your perspective If somebody is doubting whether they're still a good fit with their job, or I think also, so my frame on relationships as a uh, parenthesis is, I think it takes a lot of work to make a relationship work. I think that's normal. So I don't think whenever you're required to work or put a bit more effort, I don't think that that person isn't right for you and you need to leave because by that definition you would always end up leaving but i do think that you constantly need to ask yourself am i you know is this relationship a good fit for me so from your experience how would you advise somebody struggling to understand whether their relationship is still serving them whether their job is still the thing that they wanted to do Um, How should they navigate this? Also because the unknown, a new job, a new career, potentially being single at whatever age we're at, and I think especially as women, we're probably more sensitive to that. It's It's a very scary thought. It's something that we don't want to think of. So how would you suggest we navigate these changes? I definitely will say that without the car accident, And that experience of God, of divinity, 
I don't think I would have been able to do all of those big changes in such a short time. I don't think that's normal. And I don't think everyone needs to do that. It's just how it played out for me. What I can say, though, is that in every single area, from the job to, you know, the relationships and the fear of being alone, to leaving the country, becoming a minimalist, every single change that did happen that I would have been totally afraid of before has been replaced with something more valuable. It didn't happen overnight, but looking back and the, the accident was like what, seven years ago, you know, within the first couple of years, everything got replaced with something that was a better fit for me, which makes me have a lot of faith in the process of the universe. When people talk about trusting the universe, I can't tell anybody else to do that, but I can say that I do because it has worked out for me. So I would say that if you are a person who is feeling like something is not fitting, something has become very painful, whether it's a job or a partner or whatever, and you just have this feeling like, you know, I see the writing on the wall. I can see where this would be in five years if I stay, that kind of thing. And if you see yourself in five years without making any changes, becoming a lot less of yourself, maybe more ill, then that would definitely be a sign that maybe it's coming to completion, you know? And I completely agree with you, you know, just because a relationship is rocky doesn't mean we need to get up and leave. I will say that the relationship that I was in, it it was with somebody who had an addiction that was like in and out of being clean and sober as well as there was physical violence on occasion. So I had just pushed through and so, you know, it's not always bad. Let's make this work. I don't want to be alone. So I'm going to, I'm going to make this work. And so for me, there was like one big violent fight. And after that, that kind of made my decision. If it had been before the accident, I totally know myself and I would have stayed and just kind of made excuses for it, you know? So I think when we're really honest with ourselves, you know, like when you when you sit down, you take a moment and you really check in, you know, where am I going to be? Am I going to be a better person in five years? Is this causing me to grow and blossom? And am I learning new things? Or is it going to kind of degrade at who I am and make me less of the person that I came here to earth to be? You know, right away, you know, and I think for me, it's actually just like, okay, let's be honest with me. I had to be honest with myself. This is going nowhere. And I think very often, you know, when you were saying maybe before the accident, you would have gone into the frame of, oh, maybe we can make it work. Maybe I can just cut him some slack right now. Um, I don't just see myself in that situation, but I also see so many women that go through that. And I think it's more of a woman thing than a man thing that we cover things and we say, well, yeah, but I mean, going through the whole dating thing, again, building a relationship, again, meeting somebody, like, I mean, nobody's perfect, right? So why shouldn't I just make this work? And I think it takes a lot of courage to understand what it is that you want, what you're looking for, and to also understand when you're done. Yeah. And one other thing that I think we all kind of relate to is the fear of being alone. So I didn't really think about it because I was kind of set in my relationship for so long and I thought we'd be together forever. I never thought I'd be single in my late 30s. And so when I became single in my late 30s, I was definitely frightened at first because I realized that in many ways I had kind of grown and developed in those years in the relationship. However, in many ways, I had just relied on my ex-partner as a complete social shield. I'm a bit of an introvert. So for example, we would go to like a gathering and he'd be making jokes and talking and I could just kind of sit on the sidelines and let him know when it was time to go. There's so many examples I could give. Suddenly I'm single. And so going to like a social gathering, I realized my social skills were like kind of lacking and I was nervous before going to things. And I realized there was this whole part of myself that I had never developed and I was still kind of like the same early 20s person as when I met him and I had a lot of catching up to do so yes that is definitely frightening and not something that I was looking forward to however 
And I, you know, I've had some short relationships in this time, but I have mostly been single. And I will say that something that it has given me that I didn't think was possible was this relationship with myself that I didn't know I was missing. Falling in love with myself and trusting myself, getting to know myself through, you know, these showing up at parties by yourself and doing things that were kind of like beyond my comfort zone, traveling alone. You know, I always traveled with him. And then I realized, oh my goodness, not only am I becoming the partner that I've always wanted, <laughs> I am also becoming like a parent to myself in ways that my parenting had holes and gaps. And so now it's like, okay, I want to be the greatest person I can if I'm going to meet my next partner. And when I do, I'm going to be such a more complete human being in so many ways because of these trials by fire during being single. But now, you know, coming home to my to my place, there's this kind of like this warm feeling where I'm like, okay, I check in with myself. There's my there's my flowers in the corner. There's my there's my drum. You know, what do I need today? What does the child part of me need? You know, I really need some ice cream. You know, nobody's going to take care of me like me, you know, and we can always lose our partner to death or divorce or whatever. Who's going to be left? You know, who's going to be left? And so now I know for sure, whether I'm single or not single, I know who I left with. I'm left with the greatest partner that I could ever imagine. That's so beautiful. And it, I think it's such a sy synchronicity that we've met because that's exactly my stance on it and what I've been saying for so many years. So I had been in a very long relationship when I was in high school, six years, I think. That just, when that ended, the second one started. So early 20s, I was single and I had no idea how to be by myself because I thought, and I still remember having met uh, a friend of mine, I was telling her, well, the first thing I need to do now is find a boyfriend because I need somebody to talk to, I need support, and I just don't know how I'd go through life without a boyfriend. Who would I talk to? Who would I lean on? Who would I call when I need to call somebody? Um, so first item on, on the agenda was finding a boyfriend and that didn't happen. So it made me, actually it pushed me. And I have to say this friend was also a very independent woman. So somebody who was so proud to be independent and wouldn't want to be tied down. And she said, well, listen, I'm going to show you how to be an independent woman and you're going to do this. And I think maybe because I thought she was maybe my guardrails, you know, or sort of like the crutches that I would need to be by myself. But it just unfolded that I was by myself for a few years and I learned how to trust myself and how to be okay with it being just me. And after another relationship that I had, again, it's just been me for a long time. And it's beautiful because I always think, well, whatever happens, the partner that I'm always going to have is me. So I need to invest in that relationship. I need to make that as strong as possible because when the right person comes along, I will be such a better partner for that person because of the work that I've done for myself. And I also want to meet a person that matches that level of doing the work on themselves. I don't just want to meet somebody that's just available. And so often in my friends group as well, they'll be, well, are you still single? Haven't you met anybody? And I think it's such a big decision spending your time with somebody. I mean, it's not just somebody that wants to meet with me. Like that, that's not the only criteria. It's so much more and we've gotten a bit off track, but I think it's just so important to point this out. Who you're with is such a big part of your life. It influences so much of your life. So it's not a decision that should be made lightly or it's not something that, you know, you should just succumb to because of social pressure, because family or friends think, well, you should be with somebody. And there's definitely benefits to being in a relationship and it's wonderful and it i mean one of the best times that i've had in life was being with somebody but also knowing that even if i'm not i'm okay and whatever happens to me 
I have everything I need and within me that's just been transformative of yeah 18 year old Sabrina who would say well I need a boyfriend that's step number one on the agenda because how else would I live so that's the single slash boyfriend parenthesis so moving on to the more spiritual side of your experience because I know that after your accident and all these life changes you've leaned more into ayahuasca into different types of spiritual therapies water fasting as well amazonian diet which i'm not sure what is but i'm really interested in finding out so tell me what your experience has been with these uh, different therapies i was never interested in alternative therapies or plant medicine ceremonies i was just your, your typical westerner and then after the near-death experience, I was suddenly very interested in finding guidance about the spirit world and how to navigate being a highly sensitive person. And I immediately started to look into different options, watch different videos on YouTube about other people having spiritual experiences. And very quickly, I felt drawn to ayahuasca. I don't know why, but just watching the videos of people who are going through their healing process and using plants and plant medicine, I just thought this is for me. I don't know why, but I'm going to go. So between 2018 and 2021, I was involved in quite a few ayahuasca ceremonies. And this, this near death experience, it, it was so powerful for me, but it also, like I said, made me so highly sensitive. And it, it it eventually made me have a lot of memories of my childhood that were quite unpleasant, things I'd forgotten about. So I realized that that I needed some help and that I was now on a healing journey and there was a lot of unraveling going on. In the ayahuasca ceremonies, and you know, there were many, but the main theme and the main reason was to kind of go back and what now I would refer to as soul retrieval in shamanism is, you know, going back to in a shamanic journey or in a ceremony, times in our lives when we were younger and sometimes past lives, but oftentimes when we were younger and a crisis or a trauma took place that was so devastating that we have completely forgotten about it or we've kind of suppressed it and shoved it into the subconscious because it's just too much to deal with. And in the ceremonies, um, we revisit these things and we make peace with them. We see from the adult lens what was going on, maybe get a picture of what the, what the adults who were involved, what they were struggling with, why they acted the way that they did, kind of start to make connections and more or less, you know, welcome the emotions of that child, the the archetype of that child back into the adult life and say, you know, I'm big and strong now. I am my own parent and you need to come back because you've got a lot of gifts. You've got a lot of spontaneity and spunk and I need you in my life. I, I, I need you, but I don't want you to you know, be a memory, a painful emotion that's kind of lost in time that I'm disconnected from. So the ayahuasca ceremonies first and foremost helped me to go back to many traumatic events from my early life. And some of them involved seeing spirits. I forgot that when I was three or four years old, I would wake up in the middle of the night, have nightmares, wet my bed and be able to see beings in my room. Other times I would wake up and have a very soft feeling. And I once even saw Jesus Christ, kind of like a see-through glowing blue and white version of Jesus Christ on the end of my bed. And I remembered him from other, other dimensions and other lives. So in the ayahuasca ceremonies, I was taken right back into these very strange situations from my childhood and kind of started the process of bringing these emotions home learning how to sit with the difficult emotions that I was unable to sit with back then, didn't have the support to feel back then. Um, the the Amazonian diet, which is kind of connected to the ayahuasca, is a, it's a practice that a lot of shamans who serve ayahuasca 
from the Amazon do as part of their shamanic training. And it, it basically involves going into isolation for a minimum of two weeks, sometimes up to years at a time, eating a very, very bland diet, like no salt, no sugar, no oil, no meat, no fermented foods, no citrus. It's very, very strict. You basically eat rice and a little bit of fish or rice and a little bit of beans once a day. And it puts you in a semi-fasting state and it gives you, you know, not enough calories, but enough to be in a bit of an altered state of consciousness. You're in nature, you're somewhere in nature, and you are given a plant, a non-psychedelic plant, like rose. Rose tea is one of people's often their first Amazonian diet. And two or three times a day, you'll drink that tea and you'll meditate and you'll connect with the qualities and the essences that are connected to that plant. We call it the plant spirits. And after a couple of weeks where you're very kind of like sensitive and connected and in your altered state of consciousness, you'll start to get teachings and dreams and healing. Um, so each of these different plants, they have different qualities that will work on different parts of you. So the rose works on healing the heart. Also, cacao. Cacao works on healing the heart. Lavender works on healing the nervous system. They have tons and tons of Amazonian plants. And they're, yeah, basically the shaman um, does like a psychic scan of your body and decides on which plant you should diet. And the longer, obviously, you're in the diet, the deeper you go. And shamans in training, they do really long ones. And in their meditations, they can usually hear music, hear songs from the spirit of the plant. And then eventually when they kind of come back into normal life, they have healing songs that they can sing to the participants in their ceremonies that were kind of downloaded to them from the plant spirit world. And those songs will kind of like heal parts of the energy body. So if, if a shaman has dieted rose, they'll have a rose song. And when they sing that in the ayahuasca ceremony, it will work directly on the person's heart clear blocks in the heart. So these kind of practices, again, just kind of came came my way. I wasn't really looking, but they came my way. And they're now kind of the path that I'm on for my own personal healing. Wow. Fascinating. I love that. And I love that we live in a world where it's so easy to access different types of therapies and information and is just much more widely available than it used to be many years ago. So talking about difficult experiences, such as your accident, often enough we're faced with depression, with anxiety, with grief. Um, life just throws challenges at us. From what you've learned so far, how can we best make sense of these challenges that come our way? Yeah, Um And to kind of put it into context, my journey has been, you know, I've always had like my, my needs taken care of, enough food on the table kind of thing. But most of my life, I've had big struggles. So like I said, when I was a, a little girl, I was very much kind of caught up into the dark aspects of the spirit world. And for years, like up until I was eight or nine, I was basically in full terror all the time. I never knew if I was going to walk around the corner and it kind of be bombarded with these kind of darker energies. I was never grounded. All my years as a teenager from like 13 on, I had a binge eating disorder. I was extremely depressed. I hardly passed high school. I spent almost every day in my room. I was a cutter. I did self-harm. I ended up in the hospital because I, I, I just was kind of like going crazy. <laughs> And then I was, you know, in my relationship that often involved violence and his addiction. And then even later than that, I had a situation with another ex-boyfriend where I was, I was locked in a room for six hours after he got drunk and I told him I was leaving and he basically beat me up for six hours. I had a concussion. I was, I, it was a really, really bad. Those are a few things. I was, I had a difficult childhood with, you know, narcissistic parenting, a father that wasn't really around. So I'm kind of coming from that. And I know we've all got our story, but I think everybody who is watching a podcast like this has walked like a dark, difficult road. And so I'm with you. I just want to say that from, from the start. You have everything inside of you to handle it. This is something that I have learned. I'm 41 years old now. 
And I'm sure I'll have more dark nights of the soul to come. But what I know for sure is that you have everything inside of you to handle it. You'll never be given something that you cannot handle. The answers are inside. And, you know, most of us, I know for myself, it's always waiting for like a savior on the outside. Like one day, one of my parents is going to really show up for me. One day I'm going to meet a man who's going to really take care of me. One day, one day, you know, that day is not going to come. It is like you finding some fire inside that might be like the smallest little flame like the most tiniest little spark and saying nothing else matters. Nothing else matters except me blowing oxygen into that spark so that it at least becomes a small flame. And, you know, this is like, there are so many different tools that I've learned um, with spiritual training, but this one is sometimes we have to find our will and say no to the inner terror, say okay, anxiety, okay, depression. Yes, you're here. You are heavy. You, <laughs> you've been at me for a long time. But right now, I'm going to take the afternoon. I am going to light my favorite incense. I'm going to play my favorite music. I'm going to wrap myself in a blanket. And I'm going to say, I am a child of divinity. I am love. And I'm just saying no to the voice in my head. I'm saying no to the intrusive thoughts. I'm saying I am worth so much more than this. Even if my parents didn't treat me like I was, even if I've had abusive relationships, my voice matters. And that spark that's inside of you, and I know that we all have it, even if we can't reach this place, no trouble can reach that place. And so our job as healing from crisis and trauma and terror is to look for that spark no matter what, it's not like a sexy one time zap thing and you've got it. It's like this devoted determination to that inner child to say, no one's getting to you. No one's going to push you around anymore. No one is going to take away your peace as long as I'm here. I am the parent to that inner child and to pray. Like I pray every day, even if it's not a big long prayer, like be with me. I need strength to find and blow on that flame because life is heavy. And also to remember that everything is temporary. Like when I was in my deep, dark depression, it was almost seven years of hell. And that, that you know, I know some people are in longer hells than a seven year clinical depression, but it did end. That's the thing. And at the end of it, it gave me so much resilience to know that I could go through that and live. And then lastly, to be really aware of the lies that the darkness will tell us. The da darkness will tell us we're going to be sick forever. It's going to be depressing forever. But the truth is you will move through it. And when you do, you're going to come back with a higher level of strength and consciousness, new tools. You will have been shaped by these experiences and you start to become real, you start to become relatable and you start to alter the environments that you're in just by being there because you're a survivor, you're a survivor. And so that flame that is always inside that nobody can put out, I don't care what anyone says, nobody can put that out. That is the evidence that you are a survivor and you will get through it. So just putting all of that self-love that you can find, even if it's only a little bit, and just starting to build a container of self-respect, learning how to say no, making boundaries around that little flame, around that little inner child and saying, it stops here. Even if I feel like, like even if I feel like shit, I'm gonna make my bed. Even if I feel like shit, I am gonna buy myself something nice because I deserve it. This little child deserves it. And I'm going to live for her now. She comes first. It's a really fascinating way of looking at it. And I think very helpful to always think of nurturing that spark, that flame within us first. Because some days we can help it grow. And maybe other times we just struggle keeping the flame alive. But that should be our first priority. So beautiful. Amanda, you said you also worked with people that are people pleasers and that are trying to recover from that. And you also mentioned being one yourself. What's the way we can 
recover from people pleasing. I love this so much because to kind of like go from the end to the beginning, I'm not a fully recovered people pleaser, but I'm out of the woods, I would say. And from that place of being out of the woods, I can say there is so, so, so much peace in being out of the woods. So no matter what it takes, I'll give you a couple of my own, my own tips, but no matter what it takes, all I can promise you is it is so worth it. And the non-people pleaser that is out of the wood is going to stop just energetically. It's going to stop attracting and meeting people that, that he or she needs to people please. Those people somehow don't come around anymore. That's what you have to look forward to. And you don't have to fend them off. Kind of going back to coming out of the woods, because that's what's important here, is the hardest people are going to be the people that are closest to you because we have these really entrenched relationships where we've been kind of doing the same thing with each other for years. Those are the hardest things. And so just just knowing that it can be a real process with your partner, with your closest friends, with your family members. And so it might be easier to actually start with new people that you meet. It might be easier to start with people that you're interacting with at work who don't know you very well. And, you know, when somebody is being pushy or or they're wanting you to do something you're uncomfortable with doing, but you don't know them very well. And it could even be a stranger at the shop, you know? You start with them because there's not much to lose. You can kind of just try it out. No, that's not going to work for me. I did that with a taxi driver the other day that was going to drop me off, like not close enough to my door. (laughs) The old me would have just gotten out and like walked the rest of the way. And I was like, no, I live one house down. And he's like, oh, okay. And I was so afraid. There was a part of me that was so afraid to tell him what to do because I, I was just always the victim, but he was fine with it. He's like, oh, okay. And so building up your confidence with these strangers, with these really innocuous situations starts to give you a little bit more confidence. And then you can start to use your discretion with the more difficult relationships where there's a pattern. And I'll be honest, it can blow up. Like the day that I left my ex after 13 years, he wanted me to go on a trip the following weekend to visit one of his friends. And I normally would have said yes, even if I was so tired and kind of sick. And I was so sick from work, just chronically ill. And I said, you know, why don't you go yourself? I've got to stay here. And the minute I said that, he punched the wall. His hand went through the wall. And then he grabbed me and he pushed me in the bathroom and he locked me in the bathroom. And I realized this is why people are people pleasers. Because the result of not being a people pleaser can be very scary and frightening. It is not easy. So... We have to kind of like inch our way and use real discretion in the close relationships. But I had started to build up my strength and my resilience when I was at work. You know, I was seeing people on the ambulance calls, sometimes drunk people, and I was starting to have a lot more like boundaries with them. Got stronger, strong enough to do it at home, and it still blew up. But here we are now. So it's worth it when you're out of the woods, but just start small until you start to kind of like build up that inner strength, that that inner strength will come with a lot of little wins. Beautiful. And I think so helpful as well. Because I think many times we don't even notice when we go into people pleasing mode. Because as for your example with your ex-boyfriend, I think it's also a learned situation. So after that kind of a situation, the next time it would happen, I would have learned if I was there well, I'm not going to say no, because this is what happens if I say no. So that would have conditioned me to always say yes, or else something bad will happen. And I'd rather do something I probably don't really want to do, but that's fine. And it's better than having a big fight or being assaulted. Um, So yeah, absolutely. And I think it's worth setting boundaries and also being what has also worked for me is being transparent that I've changed. Um, So I'll often often say I may not be the person that you're used to dealing with, but now this is really important for me. So you accepting what I'm saying now as opposed to pushing back is really important. And you might not agree with it, 
but you have to let it be if you accept me or if you love me, whatever that relationship is. We also talked about being a highly sensitive person. And I think navigating this world as an HSP is a very difficult task to do. I think it's very rewarding for sure because you can feel and sense and pick up things that maybe others wouldn't, uh, but it's definitely not without its challenges. So if you were to give any piece of advice on other people that maybe are struggling to find the benefits or the balance in their sensitivity, uh, what would you say to that? Oh, I love this so much. Okay. With being highly sensitive, I think all of us have situations where We've had to go home early where someone has accused us of being too sensitive. All of these indicators from other people that we have some kind of a weakness or that we're less than the typical people. The way that I see it now after, you know, about seven, I was always a little bit sensitive. <laughs> it just got highly sensitive after the accident. So I've always kind of been there. But the way that I see it now with other highly sensitive people that I have met and connected with, like yourself and, and other amazing people in the healing circles, is that as a highly sensitive person, you, you have to first off see yourself as strong and not weak. It's actually the opposite because you are the one who's had to live in a modern world with a lot of loud pressures and still show up every day at work still have kindness and not, not lose it on somebody. So you're actually someone who is like so strong because you're, you're doing life just like everyone else, but you're also feeling everything so much louder. And so know that, know you are not weak. That is like the first thing that you have to tell yourself. And then understanding also that as humanity is in as humanity is evolving, and we can see this by looking at a lot of the children that are coming in who are extremely highly sensitive, you're on the cutting edge of evolution. And so having these kind of these feelings about things that are true, your intuition that is always turning out to be correct, <laughs> eventually you realize the faster that you accept that this is the way your body is and it doesn't need to get changed, there's nothing wrong with you, this is huge. Because we're always trying to fit ourselves into a box or a mold that somebody else wants us to be in so that we can keep up. The quicker that we can accept that this is the way our body is and we're going to work with it, the better. Then we start to build our life around that. And yes, we have to do things that are uncomfortable. Yes, we have to like go and be in groups that um, can be exhausting. These things happen. But having, when we go back to boundaries, having like you knowing what's going to keep you well and not drain you and kind of living by that in giving yourself permission and having conversations. You know, if your partner and your family member really do care about you, then they're going to understand that you need to sit in the front seat because you get car sick. If they're not okay with that, maybe you need to make some space from them. You know, it's just explaining this is how my body feels when I'm doing this. I might need to leave early just giving you a heads up. We have to teach the people around us because they're not going to automatically feel and know what's going on. We don't want to shock them. And then, yeah, and then building that life and knowing that, okay, I'm going to go to that party, but I also am planning to leave after one hour because I know the result of staying for three hours and it's I'm so drained the next day. No one's going to care. You might feel like, oh, I don't want to offend anybody. No one's going to care. Trust me, after two minutes, they're going to forget that you've even left. And so kind of like looking at your day, where am I going? What's going to be the most overwhelming place? How am I going to navigate that? And being just being really prepared and taking care of yourself because nobody's going to do it for you. Just accept that nobody <laughs> is going to cater to your needs better than you. And the quicker that we can just accept that this is the way it is, then build the life around that. And then we can start to really develop our intuition and really move into using that to, you know, to be a very spiritually gifted person because it, it can grow into some pretty amazing gifts. Wonderful. I know that you're helping people recover from people pleasing. You're helping highly sensitive people to find their strength in the sensitivity that they have been blessed with. Tell me more about the work that you do, the kind of people you help, 
and also how people can find you and reach out to you if they feel fit connected. Yeah, for sure. So most of the people that I work with, they are going through some kind of spiritual awakening, whether it's kind of like a big dramatic one or kind of something that's been kind of slowly weaving their way into their life. They're noticing a lot has changed. Maybe they're not relating to the people around them the way they used to. Maybe they're going through some, you know, so-called mental health things, but it's it just more about their life isn't fitting anymore. So usually their life has, has sped up dramatically. Maybe their old ego structure is not compatible with the new life that is unfolding. They want to let go of attachments. So there's not so much suffering. Some people are going through a real dark night of the soul where they are very disconnected from their spirit. And then also people who are experiencing yeah, the recovery from being a people pleaser, learning how to set boundaries for the first time in their life. And, you know, I, I have somebody who, who we were doing boundaries with and she was like in her 70s. So it doesn't really matter when you start. It's just about not being alone in it because, yeah, especially people who have gone through abuse or gaslighting or narcissistic parenting and romantic relationships, there's a lot to unpack. And it can be really frightening to do that alone or or when you're being supported by someone who doesn't quite get it. So yeah, those are the major things that people usually come to me with. And, you know, we just work at, we just, I'm a coach. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a counselor, but we basically work on what's showing up for you right now. What's the most difficult place to make boundaries and, you know, how can you just not be in it alone? Sometimes we just need to talk about what's going on and the answer is kind of, come from ourself so that's what i do and i have a website it's www.lionspiritcoaching.com you can email me on there i'd love to hear from you yeah.